This is far as Virgil go, but you could but you can make it back to the bridge from here. Thanks, Virgil. You stay safe, brother. Bon chance. So I'm gonna see if I can help some other folks. We've been through hell getting here. Now we at the last mile. Let's make this count. Over there. Hi, my name is Gabe Newell, and welcome to Left 4 Dead 2. We love this style of zombie-driven cooperative gameplay. Tom Leonard and the rest of the Left 4 Dead 2 team had a great time building on the design and game mechanics of the original, and we hope you have as much fun playing the game as we did making it. To listen to a commentary node, put your crosshair over the floating commentary symbol and press your use key. To stop a commentary node, put your crosshair over the rotating node and press the use key again. Some commentary nodes may take control of the game in order to show something to you. In these cases, simply press your use key again to stop the commentary. Please let me know what you think after you've had a chance to play Left 4 Dead 2. I can be reached at gaben at valvesoftware.com. I get about 10,000 emails each time we release a game. And while I can't respond to all of them, I do read all of them. Thanks and have fun. We did a lot of work in Left 4 Dead 2 to make every campaign unique in terms of flavor and gameplay. This drove our decisions in regard to locale, lighting, population, music, and events. We wanted to create a continuous set of locations proceeding through the south, with the goal of making each location iconic and evocative. We drew up an overall world map of our version of the South, and charted out a journey through a variety of locations. While each location has its own particular common zombie types, we further differentiated each campaign by creating uncommon zombies, which are thematically tied to that location. Everyone ready for the uncommon this zombies also have specific yeah, like gameplay this. mechanics yeah. that make them unique. In each campaign, the music blended specific elements of the location with the central recurring Left 4 Dead theme. We also designed new elements in each campaign where the director could take control in interesting ways, be it weather, unique paths, or types of crescendo events and finales. Since players spend the vast majority of their time shooting the common infected, we wanted to improve the feedback and visceral nature of this experience. In Left 4 Dead 1, we provided only the ability to shoot off limbs, with blood decals for bullet hits appearing only on the PC. Now, in Left 4 Dead 2, there are 43 unique ways to damage an infected. From gunfire, through melee weapons, all the way up to explosive damage. Because many of these wounds are non-fatal, players are able to wound an infected more than once, resulting in about 780 possible damage combinations. To create the appearance of a wound, we project a texture modified by an ellipsoid that culls the pixels of the wounded area from the infected, creating a cavity for the wound to fit into. To avoid memory overhead, instead of creating wound variants for each of the infected, the wounds are spawned as separate objects that work for the entire horde. Our scripting system allows us to spawn specific wounds from specific weapon hits. For example, the sniper rifle headshot explodes the head, and the axe creates a slash across the meaty areas of the body. Infected detected in this area? Really? I haven't seen any. What do y'all make of this? The body piles were generated by tossing self-colliding ragdolls into a level in-game, then exporting out the result. We were able to use a debugging tool to drag them into artistic piles, content creation at its most enjoyable. Unfortunately, the process was so efficient that it took only about two hours. The guiding sound design principles in Left 4 Dead, as well as Left 4 Dead 2, were to stay as organic as possible and to reflect the world within which the game takes place. For example, the monsters are all former human beings, grotesquely transformed. And as such, all of their vocalizations are human performances with very little effects processing, if any at all. The challenge with the new character sounds in Left 4 Dead 2 was to keep them clearly audible for gameplay, reasonably believable at unrealistic distances, and clearly identifiable as unique. 
The existing bosses already used the pitch spectrum for differentiation, so we expanded into more characterizations. The charger mutters unintelligibly to himself, the spitter is trying to screech out her bile hairball, and the jockey, well, who knows what he's on about. I'm a reload! Oh, I could go for a cold right about now. When deciding what to do about the music for Left 4 Dead 2, we face some interesting challenges. Some of the music in Left 4 Dead 1 plays an iconic and important role in gameplay, and we felt that it shouldn't really be changed. On the other hand, the game is set in the southern United States, which is rich with musical identity, so we also felt that adding some local flavor to each campaign would really help set the tone for that campaign. The solution to bridging the gap between the new local campaign music and the more traditional horror music from the first game was solved in several ways. First, we kept all the original themes from Left 4 Dead 1, but arranged them in a style consistent with the local campaign's theme. Second, we wrote an overarching set of cinematic southern goth pieces for the entire game. Finally, we wrote new pieces for the new characters in the style of Left 4 Dead 1. By doing all of this, we established that these are new characters in new places, but they're sharing the experience of everyone else in the Left 4 Dead universe. We wanted to improve the variation on the infected while keeping their memory footprint identical. The entire horde is never comprised of more than five head textures and five body textures. We use a luminosity lookup into a gradient texture for tinting variation, allowing us to not only get a hue variation, but also a luminosity variation. For example, we can make a black or white t-shirt out of the same texture map. The gradient is broken up into zones so that we can tint areas of clothing and skin differently. The infected texture also includes four distinct masks for blood and detail, such as dirt or pond scum. We randomize both the gradients and the masks each time an infected is spawned. We also randomize the body and head meshes, resulting in nearly 20,000 available variations in a typical map, up more than tenfold from the original Left 4 Dead. The infected textures are part hand-painted, part photographic reference. One of our team members had a nightmare folder full of photographs of people suffering from bizarre diseases and injuries. They were so hard to look at that the infected actually contained none of these. Instead, the secret ingredients for infecting normal-looking human textures are photos of housing insulation and potato skins. The pipe bomb has always been The pipe bomb has always been a crowd pleaser, but in Left 4 Dead 1, we were forced to disable drag dolls and jibs and replace them with a blood mist due to performance issues. This time, with a new wound system, a new rector solver and new particle effects, we finally return to our original vision. The pipe bomb causes visually catastrophic damage to the infected horde, to the delight of gamers and designers alike.
We wanted to invoke the feeling that the infected have lost their humanity and behave like feral animals. Seeing their eyes glow in the dark like those of a deer in headlights helps illustrate this. To create that effect, we authored the shader for the infected so that an artist could mark the regions that should reflect light towards the viewer in a texture. The artists quickly realized that they could also use this feature to make retro-reflective safety materials on clothing, which they put to use on several of the uncommon characters. You now see this effect on riot gear, cedar hazmat suits and construction vests. As a side benefit, we found that the retro-reflective effect also helped players identify targets in very dark areas. This restaurant was one of the first areas we populated with tables and chairs. In early playtests, a survivor would pop a boomer, and the resulting explosion sent tables and chairs flying everywhere. It was a great effect. We decided to furnish a few more areas like this so that more players would be likely to experience it at some point in the campaign. Having a shot. In Left 4 Dead 2, we wanted to give players who were looking for a narrative a little more. To do this, we introduce the four survivors to each other and the infection as we begin the game. This lets us see the world changing through their eyes, and the world is changing. Each new campaign shows a different stage in reaction to the infection. We start with Sita's naive, underwhelming response and end with the military's cold but needed resolve to save only those they can. We also connect each campaign. So while you know you escape Whispering Oaks and Dark Carnival, you also know that it's just one escape of many on your journey to safety in New Orleans. Time does pass between campaigns, but each campaign starts with the previous rescue vehicle. We also continue to spread hints and clues to the infection. There is more story in the dialogue this time around, but players should still search for and read graffiti and notes in the world. Observant players of Left 4 Dead will notice some tie-ins to the story as both games are set in the same world. That's what I'm talking about. The new Special Infected were designed with a variety of goals Charger, in mind. Roger! They needed to fill in gaps left by the other specials, they needed to provide interesting combos with other infected, and they needed to offer a new, fun set of skills for players to master, whether they were playing as or against the infected. When we began Left 4 Dead 2, we had a list of several dozen infected types that had been discussed over the past several years. We added a fair number of new designs to those, and eventually whittled our list down to the final three, the Charger, the Spitter, and the Jockey. The best survivor teams stick close together and buckle down under attack, quickly fending off infected attacks. To provide an opening for the infected to capitalize upon, we created the Charger. His charge attack not only separates members from the group, but will bowl down tightly clumped survivors, giving a few crucial moments for the other infected to attack. The only non-boss infected who is immune to being bashed, his design encourages players to play a quick trigger finger and a watchful eye on their companions, while also keeping their distance. The Spitter's area of denial attack serves a variety of purposes. 
While the initial pool of acid permits a few moments for escape, its damage increases as the acid begins to do its work. Lingering in or passing through the pool of acid is a dangerous proposition, and it can quickly force a group of survivors out of a tight spot, or drive a wedge between members of a group. The jockey is the one special that retains control after he's begun his incapacitating attack. He's also the only special that allows a survivor to maintain enough control to fight back. A well-played jockey has many ways of driving a survivor to a deadly end, either at the hands of other infected, or through the environment itself. Just getting a survivor far enough out of the group for another special to prey upon is often the jockey's greatest strength. All of these special types provide unique opportunities for combined attacks alongside the classic hunter, smoker, and boomer. The park started out having several paths that were dynamically changed for added replayability. However, playtesters found the path confusing. When we removed the dynamic objects that forced survivors to go in certain directions, we found that having all paths open led to a better experience. Players still spend a lot of time in the park, but they could choose to go different ways every time they played the level. We all ready? All right. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Grabbing a bow jar! Those zombies are incoming! Reloading! Check this shit out! With the added variety of weapons in Left 4 Dead 2, we wanted to encourage players to scavenge weapons and switch between them frequently. We found that placing ammo piles scattered through the level fought against this goal, as players tended to find one gun they liked and then never switch, as long as they had practically endless ammo. We experimented with removing ammo piles from most of the environments, so that the only way to get more ammo was to find a new gun, and we immediately saw players switching weapon types more frequently. We also experimented with giving players deployable ammo packs, similar to the upgrade packs, such as the incendiary and explosive ammo that are in the game today. Carrying an ammo pack was perceived as being less valuable than carrying a health kit, though, and many players bypassed the item, counting on finding another gun along the way. We found it was important, however, to continue to place ammo piles in the finale areas, to give players a home base to fight from in the longer set-piece battles. Reloading. The animators experimented quite a bit with the movement styles of the new special infected in order to help them contrast with the existing specials. Some early passes at the spitter featured awkward, bouncy, bird-like movements with knock knees and pigeon toes. She certainly looked different, but it was a little too humorous and didn't project enough of a feeling of strength and danger. So she ended up with much more aggressive posing and actions. We tried a few animal-inspired runs for the jockey, including sideways leaping hops like a lemur and a four-legged hyena-like gallop. These fit with his maniacal laughter, but again, needed to be more aggressive. 
Such movements also would have caused problems maneuvering the character and reading its intentions in-game, especially in Versus mode. They also seem too much of a mutation from the character's original human state when considering the amount of time from the start of his infection. The jockey's final movement pass has him on two legs with just the right touch of animal inspiration. A menacing, predatory hunch, and hands bent rather like a praying mantis, ready to give survivors a big, deadly hug. Oh, all better now. Hold up, y'all. I'm gonna heal your ass. Look here, this here first date is mine. We ready to get it on? In Left 4 Dead 1, long narrow hallways usually meant relative safety for survivors. One player could cover the front, and another could cover the rear, while players in the middle healed. With the addition of the charger, however, the long and narrow hallways in Left 4 Dead 2 turn out to be extremely dangerous. Reloading! Grenade! The two overpasses in this area continue throughout the rest of the campaign, and eventually meet up with the bridge that the survivors must cross to escape. When we initially designed the campaign, we planned for these overpasses to guide players to their eventual goal. All right, good. Look at this. These ain't zombies. Somebody's been shooting people. People shooting people? That shit ain't right, man. Fire in the hole! Reloading! Warning, alarm will sound if door is open before clearance from tower. Pills here! The alarm scenario at the bus station was the first Left 4 Dead 2 crescendo event to feature the gauntlet mode, where players must navigate along a path to deactivate the zombie rush. This proved to be a successful approach to countering the camping strategy of finding an optimal corner and holding out. And let's go, let's go, let's go! Come on, let's go! Go! Left 4 Dead 1 had a good, fictionally justifiable cast of guns, the M16 being a standard police and military weapon, for example. In Left 4 Dead 2, we had the opportunity to do something a bit less generic and use some more interesting guns, while still being aware that we had to justify their place in the game. The Desert Rifle, for example, is used to suggest that the military had rerouted guns meant for the Middle East back to deal with the domestic crisis, hence the desert camouflage scheme on the gun. The ever-popular AK-47, which is actually part AK-74, is so plentiful that it's easy to justify its appearance almost anywhere, whereas the silenced SMG is more of an underground criminal-looking weapon, so it's interesting to think how this has found its way into the survivor's hands. The hunting rifle from Left 4 Dead 1 is back, and we've added a military sniper rifle, which is double the clip size and is more of a scoped semi-automatic assault rifle, rather than the classic bolt-action sniper rifle which would be ineffective against the Horde. Left 4 Dead 2 also features a variety of pistols, including a custom civilian handgun, a standard issue police sidearm, and a large caliber magnum. Because Left 4 Dead 1 took place entirely during the night, it was fairly straightforward to light the path we wanted players to take. For campaigns that take place during the day, we had to find other tools to help the player along. The most valuable tools were visible landmarks, such as gas station signs, overpasses, the bridge, and smoke from wrecked aircraft. 
As with our efforts to replace the first aid kit, replacing the pain pills item was a challenge. Initial versions of Adrenaline allowed players to run faster and perform certain actions faster, such as reviving other players. But the pills already give 50 temporary health points, which is enough health for injured players to run at full speed again, so the Adrenaline needed something extra. We expanded the actions that could be affected by Adrenaline, shortening the time it takes to use health kits, defibrillators, and upgrade packs. We sped up the player beyond their normal maximum speed and made them resistant to being slowed down by hits from the infected. Although it doesn't give as much health as the pain pills, we found many interesting strategies began to emerge from the well-timed use of Adrenaline. Through this bus station! What do y'all make of this? Fire in the hole! We got pills! Those zombies are goddamn bulletproof! As we added more special infected characters to Left 4 Dead 2, we faced a challenge in designing unique sounds for them that players could easily recognize and distinguish from the other specials and from the common infected. In Left 4 Dead, the four male specials each had both a distinct tonal range and a character attribute to keep them unique. For instance, the Boomer's vocalizations were kind of a slow, deep, bassy, gastric horror. As we added the new specials into the mix, it became increasingly difficult to avoid impinging on the sonic space of the previous specials. We found that we couldn't rely so much on using the tonal range for distinction, and instead had to push harder on characterization to help them to read clearly to players. For example, the jockey is in the high, bright, tonal range of the smoker, and even the upper end of the hunter. But since the infection has left his brain in a constant state of hysterical mania, his vocalizations read clearly apart from these other specials. Sometimes it can be challenging to find a characterization that will lend itself to both a special's active and idle or lurking modes. For instance, with the Charger, we started out with a non-verbal angry muttering, kind of a griping bark that we all liked. Though the personality in his idle states was interesting and distinct, we found that we needed to ramp his vocalizations up to a more sustained yell for his attacks to get the right sonic intensity for these events. In subsequent playtests, however, we found that players were often surprised when attacked by the Charger as they would associate him only with the aggressive attack vocalizations he makes from the point that he sees them through his charge, and since he would generally see players before they saw him, they didn't have a chance to connect him with the angry, non-verbal mutterings of his idle states. So we ended up recording new vocalizations for these states, mixing in elements of his more strident calls and yells, amid the gripes and barks of his idle states, so that players could more readily make the leap to recognizing a lurking charger in the vicinity. The Source Engine's animation system is a powerful tool that lets us create animations procedurally instead of authoring each of them individually by hand. There are various reasons for doing this, which become clear when we consider the challenge of animating the jockey riding a survivor. From the start of the jockey's design, we wanted the survivor to be able to fight back to some degree. With that in mind, we decided it would be vital for the survivor to know the jockey's intent, regardless of how successful he was at acting on it. So even though you may be stuck against the table going nowhere with a jockey on your back, we want you to understand that the jockey is really trying to get you out that door at the end of the room, and around a corner where your friends can't help you. To accomplish this, we implemented a system of animation layers for the survivor that would work in conjunction with the jockey. These layers are attached to different controls that the code interacts with, called pose parameters. The first layer consists of the survivor's upper body from the waist up, which allows the survivor's reactions to work in sync with the jockey's motion. The second layer is the survivor's locomotion, constrained to the lower half of his body from the waist down. So, in the scenario we just described, when the jockey is in full control and has a clear path to the door, the code tells the upper body of the survivor and the body of the jockey to lean in that direction, and sets a post parameter for the survivor's legs to move along that vector as well. However, things get more interesting when the survivor regains some control and steers himself to get stuck on the table. Even though you have stopped moving towards the door, we don't want the jockey's animation to suddenly sit straight up and give the impression he isn't still trying to steer you there. 
by splitting the survivor's animation into two different animation layers that we composite together. Your upper body and the jockey can remain leaning towards the door, while the code tells the legs to stop walking because you're stuck on the table and can't advance. This robust system of procedurally compositing upper and lower body animation layers and position in real time, as we've shown in this case, saved us a lot of authoring time as well as memory inside the game, both of which are finite and very valuable on any project. Made me proud of their people! Reloading! Incoming! Up until Left 4 Dead 2, all playtests conducted at Valve required an observer from the team to sit behind each tester and observe them directly. For Left 4 Dead 2, we developed a system where a single observer could view each playtester's screen in parallel with webcams that captured the playtester's reaction. We recorded every playtest so we could go back and reference specific moments at will. This meant that most of the team could continue working during the playtest which often takes several hours out of every day. Hey, I'm reloading. reloading! Check this shit out! Reloading! Weapons over here! This drop onto the bus shows a good example of what we call a return. If a survivor walks on top of the bus, he has a height advantage against the infected. However, a smoker can pull him down off the bus so that he has to go around and up the stairs to get back with the rest of the team. Setting fires to zombies was always a high point in Left 4 Dead, and we wanted even more ways to light zombies on fire in Left 4 Dead 2. This dream gave rise to incendiary ammo. Initially, we dispensed incendiary ammo and later explosive ammo from fixed ammo boxes placed through the levels. These boxes could be used many times by a player. But while this was fun for playtesters, we found that they were either hesitant to progress away from the item or hoarded the special ammo until they really needed it. We tried replacing one of our previous experiments, the ammo pack, 
with a version that deployed a one use per player ammo upgrade box. This allowed players to carry the upgrade pack until they sensed they would need a little more firepower in an upcoming arena. And the player carrying it gets the satisfaction of providing a substantial buff to his teammates. What the hell was going on here? Fire bullets here. As with the smoker, the spitter has a gameplay style which necessitates making her more visible to the player at a distance. Since the spitter's strategy is to hit and run, striking at the survivors from far away, we needed distinct visual markers to differentiate her in the dark spaces during the chaos of combat. To this end, we concocted a glowing drool that would illuminate her and create a sharp contrast to the other game colors, while playing off the green death motif associated with the infection. The trail she leaves, which is visually similar to her projectile attack, allows players a brief chance to track her movements when she retreats to hide. Heads up. Heads up. Weapons over here! Reloading. Grenade! Chainsaw here. Reloading. After we shipped support for custom add-on campaigns via the VPK format, we realized that while many people can install and play these campaigns, it was difficult to discover what add-on campaigns Reloading. other players were playing. We also noticed that few players Reloading. were joining games of different difficulties since it wasn't clear how many other games were available for each setting. To solve this, we implemented a browser that shows nearby lobbies. The lobby browser displays the campaign, the difficulty level, and how many lobbies have open slots available. We also display lobbies for campaigns you have not yet installed, offering the chance to download them directly. Once the lobby browser was released, we saw a sharp increase in the number of custom campaigns being played. Custom survival maps are particularly popular, with themes ranging from supermarkets to medieval castles. Adrenaline shot here! Reloading! Mm. Machete here. The laser sight weapon upgrade came from an experiment during the development of the first Left 4 Dead, though we didn't end up shipping them at the time. While developing Left 4 Dead 2, when we were talking about interesting items that players could scavenge out of the levels, we remembered the visual impact of those red laser beams. The original intention of the item was to increase the accuracy of the guns, but the more valuable benefit was accidental. You can now see where the other members of your team were aiming. We also liked the choices that confronted players when they had to decide whether or not to swap out their upgraded weapon for one of a different style. Alarms everywhere, people. Watch yourselves. After Left 4 Dead 1 shipped, we wanted to experiment with an optional crescendo event. The impound lot is the final version of that experiment. It's difficult for a survivor team to navigate through without setting off a single car alarm, and if they manage it, the experience of carefully sneaking through an obstacle course full of traps is itself quite rewarding. Reloading! 
Up that ladder. Reloading! Reloading! All right. Hey, y'all. Hey, watch out! Since managing health with a first aid kit is such a large part of the player's decision process, finding a new item for the backpack slot proved to be difficult. We wanted the new item to be as valuable as a health kit in certain situations and have a big benefit for the team, as opposed to being merely another offensive weapon. It needed to have a user interface similar to the health kit, requiring a target and an action that takes some time to perform. We also liked the idea of an item that would act like a get out of jail free card, an insurance policy in case of a tank or witch attack. Our exaggerated version of a hospital defibrillator immediately conveyed the purpose of the item. Plus, it gives the survivors a chance to yell, Clear! Gonna head down and find another way up onto the bridge. Something that was always sad for us to watch in Left 4 Dead was that players would always choose an optimized path through a level once they played the map a couple times. That meant the hard work we put into other areas of the map would never be seen. So one thing we wanted to add in Left 4 Dead 2 was the ability for the AI director to change the path of the survivors through a level, so they have to take a different path each time. The cemetery contains one example of this new approach. There are four different paths that the AI director can create for the survivors. It does this by spawning in and out particular crypts and gates. Reloading. Yeah, boy. <laughs> I'm reloading. Pipe bomb out. When we began development on Left 4 Dead 2, we decided early on to cast a totally new band of survivors in the lead roles. This involved extensive concept sketches, and then a period of evaluating actors with the help of several talent agencies. Once the actors were cast, we brought them in for a full costume photo shoot and conducted 3D scanning of their facial features. This reference was then used by our artists to create high detail digital sculpts, which formed the basis of our in-game characters. The goal from the beginning was to provide the player with a lineup of believable survivors, real people juxtaposed against extraordinary situations. Gonna put up tents and shit, or keep moving. Yes. Yes. Made me proud out there, people. Something tells me they're not checking for survivors anymore. Oh, yeah.
Stop squirming. I'm going to heal you. Much, much better now. All right. Hang on. This might sting a bit. The writers originally devised a biography for a convict character. There was an idea that here in the lawless world of the infected, this escaped convict, sick of wearing prison clothes, had taken the effort to loot a very expensive white suit from an abandoned clothing store. He might as well survive the apocalypse in style. This concept gradually evolved into the riverboat gambler. This balcony was designed as a fish in a barrel moment where the survivors can come out to the street and pick off a bunch of the wandering infected without being in much danger. We felt it was a good introduction to our interpretation of Bourbon Street, giving a nice atmospheric vista without too much immediate threat. Level designers in Left 4 Dead 1 placed individual items, such as pipe bombs, molotovs, and pills, all over the levels. The AI director had the ability to pick which instance of each item to spawn. This meant that pills would never spawn in the same place as a pipe bomb or molotov. In Left 4 Dead 2, we decided that we wanted more variety in item spawning, so we now simply place an entity called a weapon item spawn. The AI director not only chooses whether or not an item will spawn in a given location, it also chooses what type of item will appear. We deliberately sought to design iconic French Quarter locales that would be fun to fight in. This jazz club gave us a nice large interior space that offered a break from exterior streets and alleys. One of the challenges with melee weapons is getting them to feel right and look decent. In order to get the fire axe to look right when playing the game, it had to cross the screen within three or four frames. To enhance visibility, we swap between the normal axe and a smeared version, along with a particle effect to cheat a motion blur. The smeared axe hits at the correct time, but allows your eyes to follow the action. Because sound is such a crucial gameplay element in Left 4 Dead, the designers needed temporary sounds to test out ideas for the new boss infected. Sometimes we were able to pull temp sounds from unused performances in our library. But in Left 4 Dead 2, the sound designers did their own temp performances. The goal with these is to be just functional enough to test the new character's viability. Reloading. As such, some of the temp voices for the characters were quite funny. While inappropriate for the actual game, some of the sounds were highly popular within the team and it was common to hear animators up and down the halls mimicking the early Charger test calls.
Left 4 Dead 2's level designers started out by experimenting with variants on the proven designs of Left 4 Dead 1. For example, we tried out several situations where there was a benefit to splitting up the group. We soon found that Left 4 Dead 1 had done such a good job of training people to stick together, it was incredibly difficult to get them to separate. We abandoned that experiment, but retained some of the elements to apply during crescendo events. For example, in the mall gun shop sequence, it can sometimes be advantageous to send one or two survivors to retrieve the cola, while the remaining survivors stay on high ground to provide cover. This is the only traditional crescendo event in the Parish Campaign. In Left 4 Dead 1, every crescendo event was essentially a button press where players held out in one spot until the infected stopped coming. While we added the onslaught and optional crescendo variations, we felt that the old school Left 4 Dead style event still had some life in it. Looking at reference from New Orleans, we saw a lot of images of Mardi Gras. We decided we couldn't have a campaign set in that region without a parade float. We designed our float to look a bit sinister. Whereas most gesture heads are typically bright and goofy, we wanted ours to be a bit darker and more scary, so we made the model appear more angular. We also chose colors that were less cheerful and more in keeping with the fall festival. Over here! Valve has a history of supporting community developers and helping to promote their creations. And with the Left 4 Dead games, we've taken the opportunity to make the great content our community produces even more accessible with our new add-on system. Content creators can package new campaigns into a single add-on file, which end users can easily install. Users can now view titles, descriptions, authors, and other information for all of their installed add-ons via an in-game interface. Add-ons work seamlessly with the matchmaking system so that users can quickly get into games featuring community campaigns they've already installed and can easily download new ones to try. The response to Left 4 Dead add-ons has been very positive and we were happy to see huge, all-new campaigns being played within weeks of the system going live. I'm reloading. reloading. Given the realistic nature of Left 4 Dead, players expect the zombies and survivors to move in natural ways. However, animating that kind of motion by hand is very difficult and time consuming, and anyone can tell when it's not quite right. Since we don't want every zombie to move the same way, a large number of motions are required to provide enough variety. All of these constraints drove us to use motion capture. The process of motion capture really begins with the character designs. Once we've decided how we want the survivors and zombies to look and behave, we audition actors just as we would any other performance piece. For instance, a 265-pound high school coach moves very differently from a 115-pound TV producer. Using one actor for both roles would be a mistake. So we look for people who fit the body type and who can bring out the character's personality and their motion. On the other hand, in the case of the zombies, we consider them more like feral animals so we'll use only one actor for all of them, regardless of gender. We then provide the studio with a digital character, a list of the moves we would like to do, and the props we'll need. Once actors are chosen, we head to the studio and spend a day with them recording the motions we need for the game. 
It's a very physically demanding day, and in order not to exhaust the actor early in the session, we oscillate the captures between high and low intensity actions. Just try crouch walking 40 feet as our survivors do, and you'll feel the burn. But that's just one of hundreds of motions we record for each character. During the session, we can watch the actor's motion applied in real time to our character model and work with them to get the look we want. In some cases, we do multiple takes to let the actor provide us with different perspectives or to add some variety. We also record the actor on video during the motion capture to use for extra reference. Reloading. With the motions recorded, the studio processes the data and then it is up to us to extract the motions we want to keep. For some motions, we need to create loops. For example, to create a run cycle, we may only use half a second from the three seconds of running we recorded at the session. We augment these recorded motions with adjustments or additions by hand, and then compile them into the character models you see in-game. Realistic human motion is very subtle and noisy, and we can all tell subconsciously when it isn't quite right, even if we can't articulate why. Without motion capture, the characters of Left 4 Dead wouldn't be nearly as convincing or as interesting as they are. I stop with the bombing! After we shipped Left 4 Dead, we heard a lot of positive responses about the infected that were unique to their locales. There were patients in the hospital, cops in the streets, and TSA agents in the airport. We wanted to add further variety to Left 4 Dead 2's campaigns, so we decided to include an uncommon common infected for each campaign. The first to be added was the Sita guy. Once we got him in the game, we realized that his uniqueness should not merely be visual, but should extend to gameplay as well. In the case of the Sita guy, his hazmat suit suggested that he should be impervious to fire. We extended this notion when we added the mud man, the clown, the construction worker, and the riot cop. The hey, we're gonna make it out of here! Reloading! Reloading! In Left 4 Dead, our designers could place alarmed cars in levels. When shot, these cars would flash and make noise, attracting the infected horde. Unfortunately, the alarmed cars would be located in the same position on every playthrough, taking away from the desired unpredictability. In Left 4 Dead 2, designers can now place groups of alarmed cars and let the AI director mix and match which cars have active alarms, if any. For example, in the section of the game that you've just played, there are three such cars whose alarm state the director can control dynamically, making this area less predictable from game to game. Woo! <laughs> we cool! All right, all right, all right. We're gonna stroll across the bridge, and the army's gonna take care of us. Or they're gonna line us up against a wall and shoot us. Well, you free to make yourself a new life right here in this room, Nick. Okay, all right, let's go. Rescue 7, this is Papa Gator, over. This is Rescue 7, over. Hey, those are soldiers. Over. Let's let them know we're here. Did not copy. Say again, Rescue 7. Over. Ten minutes, over. Copy that. All lambs extracted. Last oh, somebody ought to pick up that radio. Copy that. Over. Roger, Papa Gator, 15 minutes. Uh, be advised, we have seen flashes on the West Bank. Uh, visually confirm West Bank is clear. Over. West Bank is clear, Rescue 7. Somebody wanna grab that radio? This finale felt risky at first, since it involved the players just moving in a straight line almost the entire time. 
We wondered whether the experience would feel rich and varied enough. However, given the fiction and fantasy of the space, we found players were constantly making small movement decisions that kept them interested and immersed, and our concerns about monotony fell away. In addition, while we originally designed it to require constantly moving forward, we found that different players have different comfort levels for moving and shooting. Some players just can't do both at the same time. So we tuned the director to adapt to different play styles, adjusting the pacing so that different players would still have a good sense of progress and be able to reach the end. Hello? That's coming from the bridge. Bridge. Who is this? Hey, there are four of us on the bridge. Bridge, are you immune? We are not infected. Negative, Bridge. Are you immune? Have you encountered the infected? Encountered? Boy, I am covered in zombie blood and puke and eyeballs and 20 other parts I don't even recognize. We are immune as shit. Wind up the chopper, because here we come. Game app games are more likely to make it through production if they serve the game on multiple levels. Take this bridge ramp, for example. Movement-wise, it acts as the starting gate. Audio-wise, it acts as the starting gun. Visually, it blocks and breaks up a potentially uninteresting view. Fictionally, the seizing malfunction and resulting loud bang make it clear that the players have attracted every infected on the bridge. Let's move! One of our most important tools for creating and evaluating environments was what we called the Left for Dictionary. This collectively developed set of terms, ideas, and gameplay grammar describes spaces via their physical properties, functions to gameplay, and their relative advantage or disadvantage to the survivor or infected sides. This provided the team with a shared language for types of gameplay spaces with examples such as capillary, close quarters, open space, funnel, king of the hill, etc. It also allowed the team to talk about and explore new permutations of spaces in a very clear way. The Left for Dictionary proved instrumental in allowing us to efficiently refine our environments and tune difficulty based on an understanding of how each type of space would influence the gameplay. It was especially useful in this bridge map, where we start with a very uniform bridge and instead of rooms, hallways, etc., we create desirable game spaces using vehicles and damaged portions of the structure. Most of the region where Left 4 Dead 2 is set is quite flat. There are few hills or changes in elevation. But maps without any elevation change can be monotonous both visually and in terms of gameplay. That's why this double-decker bridge was not only a visually strong set piece, it added the much-needed element of verticality to the campaign. Stormy weather effects give the director yet another way to influence gameplay by altering the player's sensory capacity. One goal of the weather effects is to draw the team together and put them in a defensive stance such as taking refuge within a building. In this respect, weather is much like a crescendo event, but because it's entirely under director control, it can happen at any time, any place. The storm itself is created using a combination of particle effects, fog, tone mapping, local contrast, post-processing, DSP alterations, and sound effects. While technically a storm can strike in any environment, we chose to limit it to the Milltown campaign in order to provide a fictional background for the flooding of the maps. Thus the storm is thematically tied to a new navigational challenge and creates a unique experience for that campaign. Adrenaline shot here! The 
The grenade launcher came about purely out of our desire to see more explosions and more zombies killed by explosions. We found that something interesting happened when we gave one of the four survivors a grenade launcher. They became more vulnerable to close-up attacks, and their teammates adjusted their strategy accordingly. A pattern emerged where one player would lob grenades from afar at approaching mobs, and the other players would clear off the stragglers when they got too close. The new campaigns in Left 4 Dead 2 featured a great deal more water than in the original game. Therefore, it was a priority to improve our water rendering. One of the most important new pieces of technology enabled artists to paint water flow uniquely on each water surface. This allows us to make the water look like it's flowing in any direction we desire without any constraints. This not only looks better, it aids gameplay by subtly guiding the player where they need to go. As an example, in the swamp levels, the water usually appears to flow towards the end of the level. And water is far more convincing when you can actually see it flow around obstacles like trees and rocks. <laughs> oh, hell yeah! Traditionally, players were connecting to our multiplayer games by selecting a server with available player slots from a very big list. Players might select a server by an appealing server name or network latency. This worked well for 24 or 32 player games, where many players could have a great experience even without tight cooperation with their teammates. But for Left 4 Dead franchise, a different approach was required. We wanted to build a group of four players who could start a campaign together, possibly as complete strangers, but quickly acquire the feeling of being a bonded team. Valve Matchmaking operates on a vast set of player statistics, from headshot percentages of friendly fire incidents to the likelihood of sharing a first aid kit with a wounded teammate. In the years since Left 4 Dead's release, our matchmaking system has undergone many changes, resulting in better player experience and longer average team playtime together. With the introduction of new team game modes, we now even measure performance of the entire team and do our best to provide the players with reliable teammates and worthy opponents. We continue to gather and analyze an abundance of statistical information from our real-world players and use that to improve our matchmaking system. For Left 4 Dead 2, the Source engine received many new features and optimizations that enable it to handle denser, higher resolution environments, effects and characters. This gave us leeway to fit additional weapons, creatures, and larger environments into the same footprint as Left 4 Dead, while increasing the quality of each element across the board. Many of our particle effects now use several new techniques which at least double their visual resolution while requiring no additional memory. This has enabled us to create complex weather effects such as the heavy thunderstorms in the Hard Rain campaign. The new zombie horde is considerably more variable than that of the first game, with higher resolution meshes and skinning. Not only do the infected look better, but using a combinatorial meshing and shading system, there's over tenfold the number of variations possible in Left 4 Dead 2 while consuming no new memory. The environments also feature considerably more polygonal density than the first game. Many elements that would have been painted into a texture are now fully modeled in the environment. Foliage looks cleaner, while also responding naturally to weather conditions. Additionally, water has gotten a major visual upgrade over Left 4 Dead 1, with far superior lighting, reflections, and flow mapping. All these pieces come together to improve the visuals of the game while keeping it smooth to play. The Source engine uses two different methods for modeling world environments. A volume-based system for general forms and a polygon-based system for details. Each has its own advantages and disadvantages, and they must be integrated together to create a game map. One of the challenges associated with this setup is that the two systems have mostly separate authoring pipelines, and it's easy to make a change in one and break a tightly integrated set. As part of making the modular kit of parts that was used to create this bridge, we developed a new hybrid workflow that allows content authors to create and iteratively edit both types of world geometry simultaneously in a single tool. The resulting modules are pre-optimized LEGO blocks that can be fitted together, allowing the level designer to focus more on gameplay and less on modeling. 